If you, if you head off into Cot Foster's Parade this lunchtime and ask someone sitting there to tell you a story from the Bible, what are you going to get back? I mean, I reckon um, you've probably got David and Goliath. That will feature pretty highly. You might get um, Jesus dying and rising again. Never too sure whether people know that one well. But certainly Noah and his flood, that is going to come up pretty regularly. Noah is a famous man. Noah gets everywhere. You can buy... You can buy a swim hat with Noah's Ark on it. Chuck that up, Tim. There's a swim hat, slightly ironic. Um, You can even get a matching swim nappy to go with the the swim hat. Um, You can get a Noah's Ark sleeping bag or a baby grow. You can get a Playmobil Noah's Ark, great big Playmobil Noah's Ark. The Tuckwell family have got this one. Um, John Lewis has even got a Noah's Ark Dulux wooden toy. Um, But these are my favorites. And maybe there are teachers there who have used these. You can get Noah's Ark well done at school badges. Noah is everywhere. And actually, you wouldn't find a children's storybook Bible with at least a couple of pages devoted to Noah and the Ark with accompanying pictures. Here are a few pictures that I found. Um, Here's one. Chuck up the next one, Tim. They're sort of familiar pictures, aren't they? Keep them going, Tim. And uh, our fourth one, this is my favourite. I can't quite work out who's fallen overboard here, um, but it's maybe Mrs. Noah, because she's nowhere else to be found. Um, But ask yourself the question, I mean, looking at that picture, that familiar kind of drawings, but what is wrong with that picture? That it is a very cheerful scene. Leave it up, actually, Tim, leave it up. I'm going to read... Some verses again from the end of the reading that Glenda's just read for us. And listen and see if you think that fits. Chapter 7, verse 21, the final scenes in our reading. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, and all mankind, everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils, died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals And the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. If this was a movie, it would be rated 18. This is not a a children's nursery rhyme. It's completely and utterly horrific. I guess um, many of us will still remember the awful Boxing Day tsunami of uh, 2004 and the scenes of destruction. But actually, you read these verses in Genesis, how much worse? Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Now, isn't isn't it odd that, that a true story, it is a true story, I'm convinced it's a true story. In fact, I love the fact that um, you look all around the world, historians and anthropologists, they found culture after culture with their own flood narrative. I've just listed down a few. Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, Syria, Europe, India, New Guinea, Central America, North America, Australia, South America. They have all got their own flood narratives. That's interesting. Almost as if it happened. And yet there is something in us which makes us feel more comfortable turning these events into children's toys or wallpaper or swim nappies. We turn away from the horror of this moment. Now, now why do we do that? That is what I want us to think about this morning. Why do we do that? Why do we turn away from the horror? I was remembering in the week, I think I was six years old, and uh, my dad had taken me and my sister to the local shopping centre in Epsom, that's where we lived, um, to buy us our first ever camera. And the cameras he was going to buy us were were disc cameras. Do people remember them? They were totally awful things. You just got 15 little photos on a disc, and um, you took your photos, you had to send it off to get developed at some enormous cost, only to get them back and find out that your finger was in the way on most of the shots. Bring on digital photography, so much better. But we were there in Dixon's, in the queue, waiting to buy our disc cameras. Um, But it was the height of the IRA troubles. And just a few weeks earlier, there'd been a bomb at another shopping center, so everyone in little tents. And then suddenly, as we're in the queue, police come into the shopping center, and everyone is being evacuated. The shops are starting to shut down their, their metal roller shutters. Everyone leaving. Everyone, that was, except my dad, me and my sister, and a rather nervous 
sale assistant who my dad would not let leave until the transaction was completed. <laughs> it was complete madness. You should have heard what my mum said to my dad when we got home. It was complete madness. Completely blind to the danger. Now, might we make the same mistake here? The animals went in two by two, hurrah, and we laugh it off. And we miss what is going on in this moment. We've, we've got to see the danger. We need to see the horror that is being pictured for us, or else we miss a crucial truth about our Creator God. We, we've only actually had five chapters of the Bible up to this point. So we've had um, two chapters of creation. We've had one chapter of Adam and Eve disobeying God. We've had a chapter of Cain murdering his brother Abel. And then we've had a very long genealogy. And then you get to the flood and you've got four chapters, Genesis 6 to 9, four chapters of God flooding the earth. Why is so much time devoted to this moment? Just two chapters on creation. And yet how much time do we spend debating creation? But four chapters of decreation, of God flooding the earth, starting things afresh. But we just turn that into a bedroom mural. If we miss the horror of these chapters, we miss a vital truth about God. Because God is a God who must punish human sin. That's what we've desperately got to see from these chapters. God is a God who must punish human sin. Sin is not a laughing matter. Now, I realize that's not what you want to hear on a sunny Sunday morning. And um, I realize it doesn't fit very well with the kind of cuddly granddad in the sky view of God. But I really hope we can see that is what we are being shown in these verses. Look with me again. Chapter, chapter 6, verse 11. These are key verses in the account. Chapter 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Now we need to see the pictorial language that's going on here. It's as if the earth is filled to the brim with human sin. So we're told it's full of violence in verse 11. Or filled with violence because of them, verse 13. It's as though every newspaper headline would capture another account of human wrongdoing. Every TV report would, would demonstrate our utter disregard for God and his ways. And actually, that's the problem, isn't it? You, you hear this and you think, this sounds all too familiar. This is the world in which we live, full of violence. How aware are we of that, living in North London with all the, the knife crime issues there are at the moment? But you know what? It's not just out there. There's a great danger here that, that we sit in church this morning and tell ourselves, be a Noah, be righteous, live for God amongst the mockers and the scoffers around us. We'll be okay. Now, church is a very dangerous place for that. Easy to tell ourselves the problem, well, the problem's out there. It's not in here. That's not what my heart has heard reading these verses this week. I've begun to notice the, the words I speak, the thoughts I think, selfish decisions I take, John-focused, not God-focused, not, not other people-focused. I very easily put myself at the center of my life. And that condemns me. I read Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. You read that and you realize Noah's seat in this story is not my seat to take. Just play back through your last 24 hours. I doubt you need to go back further than that. How's it been? Who have you loved? Who have you lived for? Have you lived the way that you have wanted to live? My guess is not. So then you've got to ask yourself, what do you do with that? When you see something deeply unattractive in your life, what are you going to do? Are you going to...
go for the comparison approach and sort of say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. Or, or are you going to normalize it and sort of go for the, well, I mean, everyone does it. It's harmless, really. Or, or do, you, do you sweep it under the carpet? Ignore it. Hope, hope it's, it's gone tomorrow. Or do you go for the compensation route? I reckon this is quite common. You, you, you do something bad and you know it was bad, so you tell yourself, well, I'm going to do three good things to make up for the bad thing. And you start doing your three good things, but the problem is suddenly you do another bad thing and you hadn't finished your three good things. So suddenly you've got more than three good things and you just can't keep up because the bad things keep happening. Now, you, you will have your own tactic to, to respond to bits of your character that you find deeply unattractive. It's worth acknowledging to yourself what your tactic is. But then we need to hear God's response. Look with me. Chapter 7, verse 17. Chapter 7, verse 17. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth. And the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. Now we need to see what's going on here. Remember the picture was of a world filled to the brim with human sin. Our wickedness. And here as we see a, a holy, a perfect God, a God who in his, his perfect righteousness cannot stand to be in the presence of human sin, what does he do? Say, so He fills up this earth with water. He, he washes away the wickedness. Now, I think that's why the mountains are mentioned here. I, I, I'm not convinced we've got to read that literally. I'm happy to. But I don't think that's what Genesis is telling us. The point is, human sin reached to the top of the mountains. So what does God do? He fills the earth beyond the mountains to wash it all away. It's a horrific scene. But we need to see it. We need to see the holiness of the Creator God. We need to grasp the great consequences of our sin. Don't start by placing yourself in the boat. Start by placing yourself with the rest of humanity. Acknowledge your sin. Are you prepared to do that this morning? Are you prepared to acknowledge your failings? It's only then that you can look at the boat. It's only then, actually, that you understand your desperate need for a boat. That, that's when we'll, we'll start to be amazed by the tiny little details in this chapter, there are lots of lovely details. Notice them with me. Because what we see in these verses a God who grieves. This is a relational God, and he deeply mourns over the brokenness of his creation. Look back, chapter 6, verse 6. I didn't ask Glenda to read back this far, but chapter 6, verse 6. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Is that your God? A God who grieves at your sinfulness. But then we see a God who speaks, a relational God who, who communicates with his creation. He, he's not a distant deity. It's not as if the sinfulness of humanity means he has to completely withdraw himself from creation. No, it's almost as though the sinfulness draws him into conversation with creation. God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. God speaks. And then as he speaks, God gives these detailed instructions. Why, why, why are we given all the measurements for the ark? Were you asking that as Glenda read for us? Why all the detail? Is it so that we can go and build a massive replica of the ark? People have done that. Is it so that we can debate whether the animals really would have all fitted in the ark? 
people do that too. Why, why are we given the details? Maybe ask the question this way. Can you, can you think of anywhere else in the Bible where we are given detailed instructions for a building project? I reckon there are two places it happens. It happens with the tabernacle, the big tent that God told the Israelites to build for the 40 years that they spent in the wilderness. And it happens with, with the temple, which God told the Israelites to build as they got to the promised land in Jerusalem. Just two places. So when you notice that, you then want to say, well, well what links the ark and the tabernacle and the temple? What joins them together? And I want to suggest they are all places of temporary rescue from human sin. Temporary rescue from human sin. So think about the tabernacle and the temple. That is where you went to offer a sacrifice for your sin. If you sin, you had to go to the tabernacle or the temple to offer your sacrifice. But that was not a permanent solution. You had to keep going. It wasn't once for all. And the ark, the ark wasn't a permanent solution for the problem of sin. Come back in two weeks' time, Genesis chapter 9, we're going to see that very clearly. Sin has not fully and finally been dealt with. In fact, you don't need to come back in two weeks' time. Look at the world around us. Look at your own life. Sin has not fully and finally been dealt with. The ark was just a temporary solution. The tabernacle, it was a little more permanent, lasted a bit longer, but still just a temporary solution. But the ark pointed forwards to the tabernacle, and the tabernacle pointed forwards to a slightly more permanent solution, the temple in Jerusalem. A bit more stable, but still only temporary. It didn't fully and finally deal with the problem of human sin. You see, they're they're all just temporary patch-up jobs, and they leave you longing for something which will fully and finally deal with the problem. For something, or maybe someone, who once and for all would deal with the problem of human sin. And you know, as you, as you follow the Bible story through, you, you, you come to one, someone, who described his body as the temple. And he said, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it again in three days. And there were no detailed building instructions this time. It was just two pieces of wood nailed together as a cross and put up on the hillside outside Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified, where the fountain of God's judgment was poured out on him. You see, in Jesus Christ, we find, we find a new and better ark, a new and better tabernacle, temple. We find one who, who can, who did, once and for all, deal with the problem of human sin. It's no temporary patch-up job that time. It's the real thing. But do you see, if we underplay the horror of the flood, we end up underplaying the horror of the cross of Jesus Christ. We underplay the seriousness of our sin. But if we, if we see the horror, then we see the joy. Because in the flood, we, we meet a God who loves to rescue his people. Just as we finish, look down with me um, one more time. I love this verse, chapter 7, verse 16. It's a great verse. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. Don't you just love that? You can picture the scene. that All the animals have gone into the ark, and, and then the rain starts to come down. We're told it started to rain the very day that everyone got into the ark. And as the rain came down, they're looking at the door, and presumably it's a big old door. I mean, elephants are not small. And they've got this big old door, and they're saying, how are we going to close the door? And what happens? Then the Lord shut him in. Now, why does that matter? Why are we told that little detail? Because this is God's rescue plan. We're not to think that Noah was the great rescuer. All Noah did was trusted and obeyed God's word. Now, that is important. 
Come back next week. We're going to think more about that. Noah trusted and obeyed God's word, but this was God's rescue. And as we see the horror of our sin, the rightness of God's judgment, we should read these verses, and they are verses that should make us want to run for shelter. They should make us want to run to the, to the, the new and better ark, to the one who can keep us safe. In fact, more than that, he has promised, Jesus Christ has promised to keep safe everyone who will run to him for safety. So if you have not run to him, let me urge you this morning, acknowledge your sin and run to Jesus. He is the only one who can keep you safe from the flood of God's judgment. But if you have run to him, if you know the joy of finding safety in Jesus Christ, we should read these verses and we should delight in him. In fact, as we, as we share bread and wine together in a minute, we can remember again the great price that he paid. And we can cling to the cross. There is no other place to turn to be safe from God's judgment than the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to suggest we just have a moment of quiet. Then James is going to come and lead us. Let's take a, a moment to pray and reflect.